of Acts chapter 2. Amen. Acts chapter 2. And we'll begin at verse 22. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit has already fallen upon the church. And Peter is addressing the great multitude that has assembled around the upper room, having heard the noise and commotion of the Spirit of the Lord falling on that location. And I'm reading to you today, we're reading from uh, Peter's remarks, his message to the men who had come to Jerusalem. Amen. Would you stand in honor of the reading of God's Word? Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 22, Peter's message. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible. Amen. Can you say, not possible? Not possible. It was not possible that he should be held by it. You see, children, it was impossible for the Lord Jesus Christ to remain dead. It was impossible. He said, it's not possible. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life, you will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body... According to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Master, we appreciate your word so much today. You've given us an enduring account of the history of your church. Lord, you've laid a message in my spirit for this moment in time, and I pray, God, that your anointing would rest upon me. Help me, Lord, to deliver this word faithfully. Lord, help me to speak it boldly, that it might find the mark in the heart of every hearer, God, that everyone in this room, everyone that might hear this message by tape, Lord, that they might take it uh, and, and weigh it carefully, for this is probably the most important message that any man or woman, boy or girl, might ever hear. For today, God, we answer the ever-important question, what must we do? Oh, God, grant it, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated today. What must we do? We read this in verse 37. After Peter preaches his message and after he gives them this account of the life and death and resurrection and glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ, the men of Israel suddenly are pricked in their heart and they ask the question, what must we do? There is not a more important question that any human being on the face of this planet will ever ask than what must I do to be saved? What must I do to lay hold on eternal life? Here Pentecost, the birthday of the church, Peter delivers the very first sermon ever delivered in the history of Christianity under the mighty anointing of the Holy Ghost. And for the very first time in human history, Peter reveals to humanity the answer to our pressing dilemma and that nagging question, what must we do? His answer is concise and thorough. Repent. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Three steps. One that brings us to the door of God's kingdom, an act of faith. The second step, which helps us to step upon the threshold. And the act of obedience, which is the third step, which then sweeps us through the gates of God's glorious kingdom into a genuine new birth experience, which I have to tell you, this is the only experience taught by the Word of God. Amen. I know there are a lot of preachers out there today that preach all kinds of messages, and everybody's presenting a different message. Everybody's telling you something different about what you must do to be saved. If you go to the Episcopal Church, they'll tell you, well, you were baptized as an infant, so immediately you became a Christian as a child. And if you go to some of the fundamentalist churches, the Baptists, the Assemblies of God, the Church of God, I'm ashamed to say, I used to be in the Church of God. I love the Church of God. But I have news for you. They do not preach the born-again experience the way the Bible teaches it. Amen. You do not come up to the front of the church and pray your way into the kingdom. Amen. The Bible doesn't teach that. I know it's hard to hear for some people because we've heard it so much of our lives. I grew up hearing it. Have you ever read the words in your Bible, ask Jesus into your heart? No, because it's not there. Have you ever read the words in your Bible, pray the sinner's prayer? No, because it's not there. There's no such thing as a sinner's prayer. 
And yet today on television, there will be dozens of preachers who will get up and who will lead thousands of people in prayer, and they will tell them at the end of that prayer, now you are saved. And they are liars. Amen. I'm telling it real straight and plain today, folks. They are liars. Because you cannot lead someone in a prayer and have them repeat word for word what's coming from your heart and not theirs. Come on now. And expect God to suddenly sweep down and wash away their sin. No, that's not what God says in His Word. On the birthday of the church, on the first day that Christianity existed formally as a religion on the face of this planet, Peter stood up and declared plainly, What must you do? What do you have to do? I'll tell you what to do. Repent, number one. Turn from unbelief to believe, hallelujah. It's that simple. You can repent in the, in the bed of an eye. You can repent as fast as it takes you to blink. You can make your mind up in that split second time to quit living your life as though God doesn't exist and to begin living as if God is in charge and control of your very existence, hallelujah. That's repentance. To turn from one vantage point and one direction and turn completely around to the opposite. But that's not where you stop. Because if you've repented, if you've genuinely turned your back on sin and unbelief, then the very next thing you need to do is find you some water and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, not in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what Peter says. Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins. Well, Brother Morrow, if baptism in Jesus' name is for the remission of sins, then what good did my baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost do me? Absolutely none. That's the whole point. That's a religious practice based on man-made tradition that has no basis in apostolic teaching whatsoever, and therefore it's worthless. Amen. It's meaningless. Oh, brother, now that's too hard for me. I don't want to hear that. I'm not trying to be hard. I'm trying to help you understand the truth. So many people come to church and they say, Oh, I want to worship God in the Spirit. I want to dance around and I want to have a real whoop de doo time. Oh, oh. But you know what? They forget what Jesus said to that little woman at the well that day. He didn't say the time would come when men should worship God in the Spirit. No. He said when men would worship God in Spirit and in truth, hallelujah. And if the message you're preaching from your pulpit is not truth, and if the message you're celebrating in your songs is not truth, then it's worthless, it's invalid, and it's void. I don't care how much you dance. I don't care how many banners you wave. I don't care if you run till you fall dead on the floor. My Lord. Because truth is of the utmost value to God. And those that seek after God are those who seek after truth. And the Word of God tells us, buy the truth and sell it not. Hallelujah. Well, I got news for you. I don't know what all these other churches in Dallas are preaching today, all these other affirming works, but I know one thing. I know that God has set a truth church in the midst of our community so that Dallas will not be left untouched, so that Dallas will not be left alone, but so that the community we have here, the GLBT community in Dallas, is going to know the truth, and they're going to have the opportunity to embrace and obey the truth. That's the love of God, if you ask me. 
Say, I'm not just going to let them have a bunch of pray this prayer after me. Now you're saved, churches. Said, no, sir. I'm going to set up a truth church up in there that's preaching it the same way Peter preached it at Pentecost. Amen. Praise God and amen. What must we do is the answer, that uh, the question that we're answering today. Some say it doesn't really matter just exactly what we do or just exactly how we respond to the message of the gospel. After all, isn't it more important that one responds than quibble over the details of how they responded? One might say that it's only as important to follow God's designated salvation plan as it is to stick to a cookie recipe. If you're foolish enough to believe that that is the full import and ramifications of your actions. If you think, honey, that following God's design for salvation is only as important as following a cookie recipe, where well, you can just change whatever you want to change. It really doesn't make it. Well, then obviously you don't think very much of salvation. Amen. Because if you value salvation, if you appreciate what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross of Calvary, then i got news for you. You're going to buy into his sacrificial death on the cross of Calvary the way he has designed that we buy into it, not some other way. Amen. You're not going to invent your own way. You're going to come in his way. Amen. And it's a shame to me that so many people think, oh, this is an issue that doesn't really matter much. Some say that truth is subjective, it's even flexible. But Jesus said in John 4, 23 and 24, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. You want to be a true worshiper today. You don't just get happy in the Holy Ghost. You know the truth. Hallelujah. You preach the truth. You tell the truth. When somebody asks you, what must I do to be saved? You don't lie to him. You tell him the truth. Hallelujah. And he goes on to say, the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him. Must worship Him. Must worship Him in spirit and in truth. One of the biggest problems I have with the charismatic movement as a whole for the last 30 years, I've watched it. There's plenty of spirit, but there's very little truth. And without fail, the the lack of truth winds up laying waste of human souls. Amen. Did you hear me now? If you don't have truth present, before too long, you're going to wind up destroying people because the only ingredient in the world that builds and restores is truth. Anything contrary to the truth is a lie. And lies are destructive. You hear me? Yes, they're destructive. And there are people who wind up backslid out of church, quitting God, not wanting to know anything about God anymore. When I want to know anything about his church anymore, why? Because they were in a church that didn't preach the truth to begin with. Amen. And if you don't preach the truth about salvation, I'll bet you a million dollars you don't preach the truth about how you're supposed to act toward one another either. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'll bet you if you don't preach the truth about salvation, you probably don't tr preach the truth about giving. You probably don't preach the truth about the requirements of a pastor. You probably don't preach the truth about you following me. You get what I'm saying? It turns into dominoes that just collide one with another, bang, 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 right down the line. Because if you're not upholding truth as the utmost premium, the most important thing that you can possess, then children, there's danger down that highway. Amen. There's great danger down that highway. Jesus said that true worshipers are worshipers who worship not only in spirit, but also in 
truth. Some have argued that the apostolic plan of salvation was meant only for the Jewish people because they had denied the Lord Jesus Christ. Foolish. How do they answer the message that was apparently delivered to the Gentiles as Peter threw open the door of the kingdom for the household of Cornelius? In Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 48, then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. Did you hear that, children? That, that's Peter's preaching, but that's something that this preacher is still preaching today because it's truth. God shows no partiality. That's why you can be here today. Hallelujah. But in every nation, whoever fears him, Hallelujah. Whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Anybody that loves God, anybody that gives God a place in their thinking, because that's what fear means, doesn't mean you've got to be terrified of him. Anybody that tries to do right to the best of their ability within the context of who they are as a human being is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, that word you know which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day, and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us, who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. The evidence that he had physically risen from the dead was that he was able to sit and eat and drink like a flesh and blood human being after he had risen from the dead. The notion that his spirit and soul came out of the body and rose from the dead and took on a new body and that his old body remained in the grave but just disappeared somewhere, that is false doctrine. It is not truth. My Jesus got up, life returned to his body and walked out of the tomb. Hallelujah. Why do you think they had to move the stone? If all he was going to do was come out in a spiritual form, the stone could have stayed where it was. Hallelujah. Not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with them after he arose from the dead, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. How does remission of sins come? Through his name. What did Peter say? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins. Oh, but wait a minute. See, Peter wasn't preaching that same message to these Gentiles. That was only for the Jews. Baptism in Jesus' name and the Holy Ghost baptism, those being the three steps to the born-again experience, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and the Holy Ghost baptism. No, no, no. Peter wasn't preaching that to the Gentiles. That was only for the Jews. Liar. Liar. Listen to this. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed 
were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. How did they know? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. The same thing that had happened in Jerusalem. Woo! Glory! Then Peter answered, Oh, tell me Peter didn't preach the same message to the Jews that he preached to the Gentiles. i got news for you. The very next words off his lips after these men received the gift of the Holy Ghost was, Can any forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the gift of the Holy Ghost just as we have? Amen. And he commanded them to be baptized. Verse 48. In the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. He commanded them to be baptized. In the name of the Lord. Glory to God. If you've been baptized in Jesus' name, you should be rejoicing today because you're part of a small fraternity that have heard and obey this wonderful apostolic message, and you have the same experience <laughs> that Peter preached, not just to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, but what of the message delivered to the Samaritans by Philip? Now look at the actions of the apostles in Jerusalem when they heard that Samaria had believed upon the Lord and that Samaritans were being baptized in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 8, starting at verse 4. Therefore, those who were scattered, this is the church. If you remember during the time of Saul, of Tarsus before he converted and became the Apostle Paul. There was great persecution, so the church was scattered. It said, therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did, for unclean spirits crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed, and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, who previously practiced sorcery in the city, and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Did you hear me now? Now that's important because listen to the rest of the verse. It says, but when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Isn't it funny that he mentions the name of Jesus Christ here and the very next portion of that verse is speaking of baptism? Hmm. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, we know they were already baptized, but obviously the threefold message of repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and the Holy Ghost baptism was something that they 
were going to make sure was preached everywhere the gospel was preached. It wasn't enough to be baptized. Now they went down there themselves personally to pray for these people that they might receive the Holy Ghost. But listen now. For as yet he had not fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized. Laura, can you read what that says? Are you there? Well, hello. Sounds to me like Samaria got the same message that Peter preached at Pentecost. Am I telling the truth? Sounds to me like the same message Peter preached to Cornelius and his household is the same message that the Samaritans got as well. Now look also today at the, the message and ministry of the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Sounds to me like the Holy Ghost was a very important factor. Come on now. And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Now listen to the next verse. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Sounds like the folks at Ephesus got the same gospel preached to them that Jerusalem had preached to it on the day of Pentecost, that the household of Cornelius had preached to it by the Apostle Peter. Come on now. Sounds like the same exact gospel message to me. Because listen to this. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. So do you see the pattern? Do you see what I'm talking about? The apostles never deviated in their message, folks. What must we do? They answered the same way everywhere they went. Children, the simple truth today is this. Acts chapter 4, verses 8 through 12. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders which has become the chief cornerstone. But then Peter goes on to say, Now, not, excuse me, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And the early Roman church took the name of Jesus Christ out of baptism. Satan was taking the teeth out of the church. Amen. Because the power is in the name. So if he can get the name out, he made the church virtually powerless. But let me tell you, for centuries, there has always been an underground apostolic church that said, no, we're going to continue to preach what the apostles preached. When the Trinitarian controversy arose in the, the third century and they were trying to ratify it as church law, there were churches, there was a church in Rome that stood and said, no, sir, there's not but one God and his name is Jesus. 
Roman Catholic Church did not start without a fight. Let me tell you right now, folks, that organization, it began with great, great conflict because there were those who were dedicated to the Apostles' Doctrine who were not going to let that foul doctrine will rise up in the midst of the church and claim it for her own. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11 Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such, Paul said, were some of you. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, but ye are justified, how? In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now, you know what? That sounds like it's on the same exact vein as Acts 2.38 to me. Amen. Sounds to me like Paul has just spoken in the same identical vein as Acts 2 and verse 38. Revelation 2.13, listen to what the Lord Jesus had to say to two of the churches. He said, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. You see, the true apostolic faith holds fast to the name of Jesus, hallelujah, and will not let it go. He said, you have not denied my name, you've held fast to my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Revelation 3 and 8, the Lord said, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength. And has kept my word, and has not denied my name. Satan would love to get the church universal to deny the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if he can do it in baptism, he's won half the battle. Because then he has a bunch of people running around thinking they're saved that aren't. My Lord have mercy. Romans 8, 5 through 9. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot Please God. They that are in the flesh. Honey, if you haven't got the Holy Ghost in you, you're in the flesh. There are churches full of people today don't have the Holy Ghost, and, the, and, and Paul's telling us plainly, they cannot please God because they're in the flesh. He said, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Notice he put that tag on there if you have the Holy Ghost within you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. I don't even need to break that down. I think everybody can understand that real good. Paul just said it. You haven't got the Spirit of Christ, then you are not part of Christ. Sounds to me like Paul preached the same message Peter preached at Pentecost. Repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What is the importance of the gift of the Holy Ghost? Ephesians 1, 12 through 14, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of Truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, 
ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. See, that's the function of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It seals you unto the day of redemption. Listen to what he said in verse 14. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. You see, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is God's down payment on our resurrection. So therefore, in order for a person to genuinely, fully, truly be born again, they have to have the Holy Ghost. Second Corinthians 1, 21 and 22. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Do you know what the term earnest means? Anybody in the mortgage or lending industry knows what earnest is. Earnest is a down payment. And usually it's a very sizable down payment. It's not just some measly little down payment you make to hold the deal until you get the rest of the money. No. When you put down earnest money, you've got to put down a really healthy chunk of cash. And if you try to back out of that deal, guess what? You lose your earnest money. When God gave us the Holy Ghost as believers, guess what? That's a healthy down payment on our redemption. Amen. And God isn't going to back out on the deal. That's why he gave us the earnest of our inheritance. He gave us the down payment on our inheritance, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, meaning in this body, being burdened, not for that we be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that wrought us for the self-same thing is God, who also hath given us the earnest of the Spirit. Now there are three references I've just given you where God, uh, God, excuse me, where Paul speaks of the Holy Ghost being the earnest, the down payment on our redemption. Many have heard the sublime chimes of God's call, and even smelled the sweet perfume that is the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. But too many have fallen victim to the compromised message of preachers who seek to fill their pews and load their pockets rather than to declare boldly the truth of God's apostolic plan of salvation, so that heaven might be filled and hell emptied. Surely the word of the Lord is certain when it declares, Matthew 22, 14, For many are called, but few are chosen. 1 Corinthians 1, 25-29, and I am closing. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Are you hearing that? But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So you'll never come to a knowledge of the truth if you don't allow the Spirit of the Lord to lead you. The Bible said the Spirit of God leads us into all truth. There are many people today that are in churches. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that the Spirit of God is not trying to work with them and that the Spirit of the Lord doesn't have a relationship with them. But there's a difference between being led by the Spirit and there's a difference between being filled with the Spirit. Amen. And the bottom line is you're not sealed until you're filled. 
So if we're not filled today, we ought to be desiring to be filled. Amen. So that we have that assurance that we are already sealed under the day of redemption. Children, today rejoice. For you have not only been led to a place where the aroma of God's gardens may be inhaled, but you have been made uh, partakers of that great sacred fraternity whose members...